All right, Science Flipping Podcast listeners, as always, this episode is brought to you by Rocketly.ai. If you're looking for a seller lead generating system that has automation in AI bot and has sellers coming to you, then Rocketly.ai is your choice. Make sure you head over to the website, fill out an application and schedule a demo now to see the power of Rocketly.ai. What is up, Science of Flipping family? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, The Science of Flipping. Jeremy B. Land is in the house. He's an incredible real estate investor, someone that I had the privilege of getting to know in the boardroom mastermind. And most recently, I got to know a little bit more about his story. What is up, brother? What's happening? How are you? Hey, Justin. Uh, man, life is great. Just happy to be on the show. It's a privilege. It's an honor. Thank you for having me as a guest today. I really appreciate it. So, little known story, where uh, I lived, did you know I lived in Boston for about a year? I did not know that. It's a great yeah. city. It is a great city. I lived right in Beacon Hill, so right downtown. Yeah, yeah. I owned a door-to-door sales company. Wow. And uh, you can imagine how a California boy, yours truly, <laughs> uh, handled going door-to-door in the winter. Yeah, it's uh, all great. Let's yeah. just say I had to call my family and move back to California. Not kidding smart. at all. That was smart. Yeah, we, my wife and I, we woke up this morning to go for a morning walk. It was a, a balmy 16 degrees this morning. It was lovely. <laughs> a, a balmy. Yeah, uh, no, dude, so listen, you have a eerily uh, similar story to mine. And I knew the second we started talking about that, that this episode was going to be fire because you have created something really, really special coming from a very dark place. I've been able to, I pride myself on doing the very same thing. And I think the more people hear from myself, but not just myself, but people like yourself, that regardless of the predicament you're in, regardless of where you're at financially, regardless of the situation that you think is insurmountable, it can be overcome as long as you go do my five principles, decide what you want and who you need to be get it and commit to it and take massive action. Those three are, you are the epitome of it, dude. So I'd love to just jump into your story a little bit so people get to know a little bit more about Jeremy and in that side of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. So my name's Jeremy Beelan. I'm out of New Hampshire, just an hour north of Boston. Um, you know, I was a troubled youth as a kid, got arrested a lot, didn't even graduate high school. All the good all the things you don't want your child to be as a kid, I was. Um, you know, around 13, 14 years old, my family ended up losing everything. We ended up losing everything in foreclosure and had a cause repossessed and everything. And and I went into a world of trouble after that, getting arrested, drugs, drinking. And then eventually somehow as I hit my 20s, I found health and fitness and I kind of got into this life of like, all right, I want a self-improvement and get better. And then I found myself with a good sales job in my early 20s. I was originally high-rise window cleaning in Boston, uh, some of the buildings that you probably door knocking on in the winter, not a lot of fun. Um, you know, 19, you know, about 20, 21 years old, I found myself a sales job and did pretty well into my twenties. And then, you know, I got married, had two young kids. I was, you know, living in the traditional middle-class America house. It was like my dream come true, white picket fence type house. And I was doing great, making six figures. And I just had everything that I want. And then all of a sudden, 2009, 2010 came a lot of people, you know, maybe young on as far as your audience goes, but that was the time of the great recession. And it was dark during that time. And I went from having a really good six-figure job to be basically a year later out of work. And because I had no college education or even high school education, uh, it wasn't just a housing crisis at that time. It was an employment crisis. And I couldn't find work anywhere. And I was like you, Dordoch. I was going through the old yellow pages trying to find a job every single day to provide for my family. And I couldn't. And at this time... I was get I was at facing foreclosure. I was facing facing bankruptcy. The mortgage companies were folding left and right at that time, and I actually started to learn about real estate investing at that time. Started doing um, some training. Started reading some books. We used to have to get CDs, audio CDs from the library back in the day before all these wonderful podcasts. But you know what happened was that I was able to realize that I might going to be able to save my house if I get a real estate investor involved. So I ended up finding a real estate investor in my local market. He came out and said, hey, Jeremy, you know what? We can help you in your situation here. I can short sale. I can work with this mortgage company, prevent you from foreclosure and bankruptcy, which was great because I wanted to go into the Air Force at the time. It was the only job opportunity I had. But in order to go in there because I needed a top secret clearance, they wouldn't allow me to go in with a foreclosure or bankruptcy because they were afraid I was going to steal government secrets or something like that. 
So, you know, at, make a long story short, this guy came in, he sure sealed my house. You know, he was able to give me money for like a refrigerator and money for like a pool and a shed out back. And at that time, that was money for like food on the table for my kids. It was Christmas gifts that we needed at that time. And yeah. it was clothes to put on my children's back. They were only three and one at the time. I was in a huge depression. So he saved my ass. And then I went into basic training just before the age cutoff at 34 years old, left my family for six months. I was in there with a bunch of 17 year old kids. My nickname was Gramps. And they're like getting yelled at, being like dirt bag training get on push-ups and all this crazy stuff by 24 year old kids but it was actually the best thing that could ever happen to me because i actually went in there and i i rebuilt myself i i was selfishly had to go away to work on my confidence and i came back out as a new man i started building myself back up got divorced had you know i was a divorced kid, dad now with two kids got myself back into making a six-figure sales job and then i started to approach 40 years old and then I started to see people in the 40s and 50s start to be like unemployable. Basically, they were losing their jobs. Like you spent all this time going up the corporate ladder, but the further and higher you go, the more stable it comes. And I just didn't want to be in a third situation in my life where I was losing it again. And I was super scared. So, you know, I started looking at, I want to get into real estate investing. And then I realized the best way for me to get in, because I had no money, because I didn't know you could use other people's money at that time. I just thought you had to have money, um, was to get into wholesaling. And I thought if I could get into wholesaling, at least I can learn to get um, great deals from the bottom level, direct to the seller. And then I could decide what I want to do for them, whether I want to wholesale them, flip them, keep them as rentals, etc. So at that time, I had a condo that I lived in for two years. I basically sold that townhouse, made $17,000 worth of um, equity. It was the only money that I had. I paid $6,000 of credit card debt. I took $11,000. I take, took five of it and I invested into a coaching program called Wholesaling Inc. with Tom Kroll. Taught me how to wholesale my first deal in 90 days. That $6,000 was my marketing budget, my contract, my LLC. I basically started my business with 11 grand, moved my kids into this crappy two bedroom apartment in the crappy part of town. And I was all in just as I was turning 40 years old. And then since then, I sit today on this podcast at 47, I've gone on to do over 400 off-market deals, over $8 million in gross profits, and I built three different markets to seven figures since then. Uh, obviously, I've had a lot of help with a lot of great coaches along the way. It wasn't just that one coach. But, um, you know, as you said to start this, man, like there's so many times I could have said, I don't have the money. I, I don't, I have kids. I don't have the bandwidth, whatever the excuses are. I just made it happen. It wasn't easy, but man, I'm so thankful I did. So that's my story. Yeah. Well, so it, there's so many things that I want to be able to unpack here, right? All the way to the point of like, you know, you tend to repeat what your parents gave you, right? Yeah. And, and you talking about how your parents and family were never really good with money and this type of stuff. And that trickles into you and then all of a sudden you find yourself going through a foreclosure scenario. I want to talk about what a short sale is versus a foreclosure. But sure. really what I want to highlight and, and you should be very proud for yourself because it's something I find to be some of the main characteristics of the most successful people I've ever interviewed here on this podcast and or myself or otherwise is people make a decision that they're done and they want more and they decide what they want. And that's what you were able to do and you decided who you needed to be to get it. Part of that was joining the, the, I think you said Navy or was it the Air Force? Air Force, yeah. Air Force. Yeah. Part of that was joining the Air Force. I needed to shape up. I needed to shape up, ship out, like put my shit together. So yeah. you decided who you needed to be. That is a hard one for a lot of people because they're not willing to make the sacrifice. You don't want to leave your children. No. You don't want to go do that. You don't want to be called Gramps and waking up crazy early and doing push-ups when, you know, 19-year-olds are basically, you know, punking you, right? Yeah. But you made that decision of what you wanted. Then you made the decision who you needed to be. And then you took massive action, right? And in that, you know, well, I'm sorry. First, then you committed to it. The commitment yep. was selling your home, yep. paying a coach, and going all in. All in. That's committed, right? And then lastly, you took massive action. And that's those three pillars. Decide what you want and who you need to be. Commit to it. And then take massive action. You embody that, right? And that is why I was super excited to have you on this podcast is because you yourself, whether you knew my principles or not, which you didn't, of course, but you literally did that. And it just goes to show those three. Now there's two other ones, which is being extremely uncomfortable, which you were right. You yeah. moved your kids into a two bedroom house. It was not comfortable. You were financially like pushing yourself. And then lastly, not worrying about when the results were going to come, right? Not having a time result expectation that you put on yourself. You just knew they were going to come and you embody all those principles. So I applaud you and you should be proud for yourself. 
But let's take a, a rewind really quick for all those that don't know what a short sale is besides uh, or in comparison to a foreclosure. He didn't go through foreclosure. The bank took a short on the loan that he owed them. That's all. Someone bought it for less than he owned the bank, which kept a foreclosure off of his credit score, etc. So it really does help him. I went through foreclosure. Uh, and so that was a very big bummer, right? I slept on a couch, went through foreclosure. Let's unpack a little bit of this and we'll get into the real estate stuff, I swear, but unpack a little bit of the cyclical inherited, geez, yeah. uh, part of like putting yourself into kind of fucked situations financially that kind of became uh, adopted from you, from your parents, right? Is is that part is very common, I see all the time when talking to to people that ultimately end up making it, you can go and say, you put yourself in this bad scenario because that's what you were shown as a kid and you replicated it. Yeah, to some extent, you know, obviously I didn't know what I didn't know. So we follow our parents as, you know, basically how to live life and what to do and what not to do. Their situation was a little bit different. You know, they basically, you know, took, he, my, my stepfather at the time quit his job and decided to start a business and just, just, made a huge mistakes and didn't care to fix it. You know, my situation was like, I was out of a job, whether I wanted to be or not. I was very successful, but the whole economy changed in a year. I yeah. just put an addition on my house. And within a year and a half later, it was upside down $150,000 in equity. There was no loan modifications, no refinance options. It was nothing. I was, I was, I was screwed. Yeah. And I can't find a job anywhere because I never graduated high school. I went to college and, you know, I went from making a hundred thousand dollars plus a year to two years later in the Air Force, make it $32,000 a year. And that was the best I could find. Um, you know, my what I learned from that time was I was living to the edge of my means, right? So if I made $100,000 a year, I spent $100,000 a year. We, you know, we had a pool, we put on the addition, you know, we took all the equity out of our house, you know, different things like that. You know, I don't do that stuff anymore. That was the big mistake I made then. Um, but what that time really taught me, more so, for myself than as going through a childhood is just, you know, if you, if you think you're just safe working a job for somebody, or if you think you're just safe, just going to do what you got to do, things could change. And I, I, you know, and if I'm going down with the ship, I want it to be like, I Your ship. fighting in my ship. Right. And I'm going to put all in and just work my butt off. And listen, you know, it's still not easy after all these years. I still have sleepless nights. I still have sure. cash flow problems occasionally. And, you know, sometimes I have all these stresses of a team and all this other stuff that comes along with it. But I want to change for the world. I love it. And it's better than going into a, a place where you can be easily just say, Hey, we're downsizing. We're going to let you go. And then what? Right. And that's scary to me. Yeah, you give, you're making a decision to allow someone else to have the ultimate decision. Right. Right. Yeah, and so that. you didn't want that. And like I said, you, you, if you're going to go down with a ship, you'd rather it be your damn ship that you're going down with, right? Rather than someone else's. So let's get into the real estate spot because, right. you know, this is what we're all here to talk about. <laughs> um, you've done very well over the last seven years. You've done well, you know, 400, 400 and something deals in the last yes. seven years, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Where are you primarily finding those deals? What is your, you know, marketing or lead gen that you focus on? Yeah. So, you know, it's been in a few different markets. Our primary market right now is, um, you know, Southeast Florida and New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Um, those are the two markets we, we focus on now. You know, it, it really depends. The marketing has changed a lot over the years. So we, it, we're constantly ebb and flowing. What we do marketing today may change in six months, 12 months, because we just sure. check our KPIs. But everything we do is based off off-market acquisition. So, you know, we do inbound and outbound lead generation to look for distressed properties, owners, or distressed people, distressed situations, and an effort to acquire their properties at a deep discount exchange for, you know, and give them great value for whatever their problems are, a solution to their problem, in exchange for equity in their homes. And then we decide once we get the property under contract, what we want to do from it. And we have different exit strategies for that. But, you know, we do things like direct mail. We've done cold calling. We do pay-per-click, social media marketing, like Facebook marketing. Uh, we're doing direct uh, TV ads these days. Uh, we do pay, per, pay leads. You know, we've done it all. Um, we don't do texting anymore. Uh, that was great three years ago. We've abandoned it as of last year. The, it just wasn't working anymore with the um, regulations. I mean, you even do ringless voicemail, stuff like that. So we're always doing different things. We usually have a few different marketing channels going on. We try to just run it simple and lean. Yeah, so the thing that I, I echo, and I, you and I are definitely cut from the same cloth, brother, is 
you need to have multiple marketing strategies. I don't care if they're paid or free, right? And so what I mean by that is if you're doing direct mail or PPC, those are heavily paid, probably the most expensive, right, in the space. Or if you are generating leads from other investors and bringing buyers and doing co-wholesalers, I don't care if you're calling agents and making offers on listed properties. Those are essentially free models, right? And there's other free models, yep. door knocking, et cetera. But I don't care how much money goes in or how much time you're spending. You should always have two or three at a minimum two um, because people like you and people like I do. So if you're listening to this and you're newer, then you need to wrap your head around that, right? I talk a lot about being dynamic or versatile. Like you can't just be a one trick pony. My story always talks about when I was buying homes only from the auction and the hedge funds came in. Well, they were paying 110 cents on something I could pay 70 cents on. I, I stopped buying homes. I couldn't buy. I couldn't compete, right? But that was my only way to get deals. So I had to make a change, right? And if you make a change too late, you can go under financially. And it almost happened to me three different times. I've made the same damn mistake. So now I know a lot better. Now I can help others listening to this episode and you can help others uh, in your program, make sure that they're not just one trick ponies. You're not right. just doing just direct mail or you're not doing just whole, uh, uh, door knocking or whatever yeah. you need. Make yeah. sure you're diverse and, and versatile in your marketing strategy. And you agree with this, right? This is just a straight lead game. The more it leads and more opportunities yeah. you have, to your point, the more you can exit. You can wholesale, you can flip it, you can keep it as a rental. Yeah, for sure. You know, and what I've learned over the years is like what works for marketing in one market may actually don't even work in other markets. So you sure. really have to just check in. You know, we always have a few going on at a time, but we're constantly testing and retesting marketing channels, right? So if we just said, and this we do this by KPI, key performance indicators, they basically guide us to what decisions we make from a marketing standpoint. You know, if I just said, hey, well, we're doing texting because it's cheap. Well, you know, I got 11 to one return on that in 2019. Now I'm lucky to get a one to one return, right? So it doesn't work anymore. The KPIs tell you that. And, you know, sometimes mailing is great. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes cold call is great. Sometimes it isn't. So we're constantly testing and retesting. And, you know, um, you know, so we're always just trying different things to just make sure we get a good return in general. Uh, marketing is, you know, it's finicky and it takes some time. But all the marketing channels work, to your point, all great for lead gen. I really think, you know, the key to success in this industry is your ability to take those leads that come in and your ability from a sales side to use it, convert them to revenue. You know, the, 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 the way, the ability to take less leads, leads to convert to deals is a lot better than somebody who doesn't have experience and takes a lot of leads to convert to the same amount of deals. Like that, that nuance and that skill and that practice and that experience and that uh, education, I think is critical in this industry. And I think a lot of times it's overlooked, unfortunately. 100%. The, the things that you said, right, you need to make sure you're adaptive in your marketing. Things change literally overnight, right? I mean, literally, you now everyone now sees what's happening with text messaging is essentially dead. Um, I know it's not officially dead, but very, very, very difficult relative to what it was a year or two years ago. Everyone understands what direct mail was, you know, five, 10 years ago. I was getting north of a 1% callback rate. Nowadays, we're lucky to get a quarter of 1% callback rate. Right. I mean, things just change. PPC marketing, Google PPC, you know, we were be able to get leads for like $50 a lead. Now it's like two fifty, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars $500, $500 a lead. Yeah. Things change. You have to change with it. A secret to my success in real estate over 16 years is that exact principle. Being able to be, uh, being able to adapt, being able to be fluid and move with the markets, move with the changing times. Now AI is a big component. We use rocketly.ai, which obviously I have to introduce you to that if you haven't seen it yet. But it is a massive game changer. And this all happened since literally, I can remember June of 2023 is when we built Rocketly, which was not Rocketly at the time, it was just internal. You have to adapt, you have to change. COVID made us change. COVID made us go 100% virtual. You yeah. can't... You can't expect to continue to win at a high level doing the same thing you've always done forever. You might make some money, especially if you're just doing the right thing, but you're not going to win at an extreme level if you're not adapting and changing. That's what you're highlighting. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I wish that the market was always up and to the right, but last year showed that that isn't the case. And talking about pivoting, 2023 was probably more of a pivot for most people than it was in 2020 with COVID. And yeah, I mean, you, you, we're constantly pivoting and adapting. It's been a change. And I think 
from my company's success, you know, obviously it's the biggest challenge, but it's also our biggest, biggest accomplishment to persevere through all this. You know, I've seen a lot of people come and go already in my time of being in this business for seven years, uh. but the ones that are able to, you know, survive, thrive, but you have to find ways to just, you know, constantly pivot through all the challenges. Like you said, it's not going to always just do the same thing and expect up to the right to result. Well, once the interest rates go from two to seven, that changes everything. And people rate locked in their homes that, and a lot of those people aren't selling anymore. That changes a lot of things. There's no doubt. The, the thing that you and I were kind of offline just chatting about is this idea of being a dynamic real estate investor, which is how my, how I label it, but you might say something different, but it's essentially it is polarizing to say, don't be a one trick pony and only wholesale. Don't right. do that. You know, wholesaling yeah. has a space to go get your first check, second check, fifth check. But if you want to grow something special, if you really want to be a big real estate investor making real money, you have to be dynamic. You have to be fix and flipping. You have to be running the burr model. You have to have long-term, short-term rentals. You have to be doing novations. It's all encompassing. Yeah. And we do all those things that, you know, just in the first couple of years when I didn't know any better and we didn't really have much resources. We were living wholesale deal to wholesale deal, right? The money came in, we put it back into the business, try to grow the business and spend money on marketing. A lot of times too much money because I didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, as soon as I knew how to leverage other people's money and I couldn't, it couldn't happen fast enough because I got sick of dealing with the cash buyers because I felt like they were always nickel and diming me and I was spending so much time and effort and money getting these great off-market deals, I felt like I was leaving a lot of money on the table. So one of the exit strategies we first did was we started listing all of our stuff on the MLS. And I went from a $20,000 average, you know, uh, disposition fee to $35,000 overnight, just with the power of the MLS. It was a game changer in my business. And then we filed private money, which allowed us to now start taking down properties. We started wholetailing. We started flipping. We gave us opportunities to do burrs. Um, Novations, we do that a lot. We do a lot of direct to um, and retail buyers. So a lot of our houses qualify for traditional financing. Um, they're maybe a house that may be a little dirty, a little bit dated, but is move-in ready. But the sell is distressed. So we still get it at a discount. But for your average fix a flipper, there's not enough meat on the bone. But for a retail buyer, it works great. They get it five, 10% below market value. It's a win for everybody. And we still make money doing it. So yeah, we have many, many multiple exit strategies. That's why for us, it's all about focusing on off-market acquisitions, acquiring any property we can, putting it under contract, and then leveraging our knowledge to dispo out of it as profitably as possible. What is, um, so for those that don't know what an ovation is, it is essentially the way to wholesale a property on the MLS, right? So you contract a property, you get a couple documents signed, attorney in fact, et cetera, to get the authority to put it on the MLS. You put it on the MLS for a flat fee, uh, usually not having any agent involved. And then it opens up your buyer pool, right? I mean, it quite literally is how all of the experts, myself, Jeremy, so many others that have been around for any amount of time. It is how we maximize our dollar on every single lead possible um, because we have a buyer pool of the entire MLS, which is the biggest buyer pool there is, right? Um, Absolutely. It's been a game changer in our industry. And I, I would, I, I, I rarely sell things off market anymore. As, as much as, as much as the sellers will allow me to uh, put their property on the MLS, as much as I'm going to do it. What do you have your, your pitch for innovation? What's your style of pitch? I mean, I've heard a handful. What do you say? Yeah, you know, so the way we do novations typically is just what happens is if we have a property uh, under contract that we're showing on the MLS, you know, it, it, rather than doing a double close, we'll a lot of times have this seller sign a contract with us that puts seller A together with buyer B, and we end up being the third party and basically allowing us to put them into contracts. So they we sign the rights over but still for the fee, we still pay the commissions and closing costs. So it's kind of this workaround thing. Uh, I'm really not good at articulating it because it's a little complex. It's not as hard as it sounds. My sales guys do a great job at navigating it. We don't do it a lot. We probably do it half a dozen times a year. Yeah, it, it's a game changer for sure. What is um, What would you tell someone who's maybe a little gun shy about going after marketing? What would advice be to that person who doesn't know what marketing, doesn't know how much to spend, a little scared to kind of jump into the marketing game. Yeah, well, I mean, it really comes down to your individual uh, situation. So it's going to be two things. If you think of like a scale where you would weigh two things, you know, you're going to have one side that's going to be money. The other side is going to be time and effort. So the more money you spend on marketing, the less time and effort you have to 
be involved, right? Um, but if you're not going to spend a lot of money, you're probably going to have to spend a lot more time and effort, meaning like cold calling and door knocking is relatively cheap if you're doing it yourself, but it requires a lot of time and effort. PPC doesn't require a lot of time and effort other than just answering your phone, but it's very expensive, right? So finding that combination that works best for you and individually is best. Um, you know, it's really hard to be a professional off-market acquisition company, whether you want to buy properties to for flip or to wholesale, whatever your exit strategy is, and not realize that marketing is going to be an expense. You don't have to spend a ton of money, but there is marketing involved, just like with any business. We're a marketing business first. We're spending money to market to generate leads. Now, if you want to just go knock on doors, great. Well, I'm telling you, you're going to have to knock on a thousand doors before you get a deal. It's going to be costing nothing except for time, but a thousand um, doors. You know, if you want to do cold call and pull less and just start calling, that's great. Be a hustler. But reality is you're going to probably be calling two or three hours a day, six days a week, probably for six weeks straight before you get your first deal. And then you still have to keep calling after that to get your second deal. Most people never do it because they lose motivation and get burnout. So, you know, find a way to come up with some money. You have credit cards. You're going out drinking with the guys. You're going to sporting events. You're buying nice clothes. Think about things that you're spending money on that you don't necessarily have to sit spend money on. Find a way to save some of that. Find a way to borrow some money. Find a way to sell your house like I did. Whatever it takes. If this is really the path you want to do, then you got to be all in. It's, you're going to have to spend some money. I always spend $6,000 originally to stop my business. And there was a couple times I was like, holy shit, I'm going to run out of money here. And then the deal came in. And then you live to the next deal. And then eventually you just start getting big, big momentum on your side and it starts taking off. And your first year will be the hottest year. You're going to be working and it's you know, struggling to pull together every deal and every ounce of revenue you can, but you're going to build this awesome, great foundation that's going to change the rest of your life. But you're going to need some marketing. So you don't be afraid. You got to just spend it. It is what it is. Yeah. The, the willingness to sacrifice, whether it is again, going out drinking with your boys, buying nice clothes, living like, you know, you are a shining example of someone who lived like most people are not willing to live. Most people are not willing to sell their house to come up with 17 grand, right? Most people won't do those things. Um, I've talked to thousands of entrepreneurs now since, you know, I started podcasting back in 2013, by the way. I just saw my first podcast was back Amazing. in August of 2013. Congratulations, that's impressive. Thank you. Um, but after talking to thousands of entrepreneurs, thousands of real estate investors, it always goes back to the people who are willing to make the sacrifice, whatever that is. It, it could be financially, it could be, you know, time, time sacrifice. Um, it could be personal sacrifices. Like I interviewed uh, a guy by name is Jason Wojo, incredible online marketer. Uh, he basically hasn't dated for five or six years. He yeah. has locked himself in his house and just perfected his craft to the point of now, five or six years later, he's like, all right. I've hired the team finally. The things are going. I can exit and I can actually start dating. And he hired a dating coach. I just bring that example up because those that reach high highs, they make sacrifice. And those of you that want to be in real estate investing, those of you that want to be, you know, that you love the TV shows, I know Jeremy and I are both going to support you. We're both going to be here for you. Jeremy has a coaching program. Um, and, you know, make sure at the end of this, we'll, we'll tell you where to go find more about Jeremy. But we want you to get into the space because it is more fun to win with people than it is to do it alone. But also, we also know the life it can create. And so we don't need everyone to make massive sacrifices, but you will need to make something, some yeah. level, whether it's a financial cut the check sacrifice, whether it's a, you know, stop going out with the boys sacrifice, whether it's a video game sacrifice, sell a home sacrifice, whatever. Understand that is one of the biggest uh, ingredients in success is willingness to do it. And here's what I would say to end this little rant. If you aren't willing to sacrifice, then just don't bitch. Don't complain. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it. your job. Yeah. Live a mediocre life. Sure. Make a hundred grand or 200 grand a year. Be okay with that. And don't complain. Yeah. That's all I got to say to you. Josh, I couldn't agree more. And to your point, you know, I, I had to burn the candle for the first three years of starting my business and it was really hot. Like seven days a week, you know, I was going, going, going. And, you know, there was a lot of compromise to sacrifice. But three years after that, I built a team. Now I have an abundance of time freedom. I can yeah. do whatever I want whenever I want. So ask yourself, are you willing to work really hard for three years to build a life where you can then come and go as much as you want the rest of your life? 
I think we all know the answer. The hot pot, though, Justin, and make one more point just to piggyback on your list, is I think about people like in the um, when they start the gym in January, right? They want to lose weight or they're going to quit alcohol. Nobody ever makes it three weeks, four weeks, right? And then they all quit. So it's like a New Year's re- resolution. So if you're going to, if you want to change your life, you have to be that person that says, I'm going to make all the sacrifices and compromises I need to do to go to the gym for an entire year and I'm not going to quit. If you're going to be the person that just falls back into the same old routine and starts making excuses three, four weeks in, then you're going to probably do the same with this business. And again, like you said, don't bitch because that's the life you choose. That's it. Real estate investing is an incredible art. It's an incredible way to make money. And then it's an incredible way to build wealth, right? I just bought, my buddy just made this hoodie. It says, rich is not wealthy. Um, and I and I love it. And I just wore it to boardroom because you and I, you know, yeah. obviously connected at boardroom. But it's true. You yeah. know, you are not wealthy if you're rich. So I, I would choose, you know, wealthy over rich every day. Um, but the reality is real estate is the only vertical I'm aware of that can create both simultaneously, right? You can get very rich in technology, right? You can go create a... Yeah billion dollar technology company, but then you have to sell the company. You have to take your money. You have to go invest it into real estate, which Which would create, right? So, but we are in the space of like, we can go make a lot of money and increase our wealth over time. Talk to me a little bit about your model. Do you have any formula of the, the wholesale, the flip to, to buy and burr? Like, do you wholesale one, keep one as a rental, flip one, keep one as a rental? Do you have any type of, of, formula to it uh i don't have a, f- a formula to that extent um you know as far as buying it hold i want to buy it hold as many as i can that's actually one of my personal goals this year so you know as we've gone and scaled and built different markets and you know obviously 2023 we had some challenges as well you know it really just depends on like cash flow needs and everything else so you know a lot of times we just look at like all right what's coming in the pike do we we're already working on three or four projects do we want to take on more and suck the bandwidth out of the company, know this wholesale, um, you know, is this is, does this make a great buy and hold up here in the Northeast buy and hold is very, very expensive. When I started this, um, journey, you, you know, you could find a nice off market, um, property for like $50,000 a door. Now it's $200,000 a door. Yeah. So, you know, it's very hard to cash flow up here, but the equity gain o- over years is, is very enticing to get into it. So, you know, it's very tough. You know, we just kind of monitor whatever the company needs are. And you know, obviously I'd love to say that every month, like clockwork, you know, 10 deals comes in, but some months it's 10, some months it's zero. The next month is six. So you have to weave all those things. And unfortunately money still goes out the door whether money comes in or not. So we just kind of weave all that. But personally, I'm trying to buy and hold as much as I can. That is my personal wealth. I allow my people on my team that opportunity too, because I want them to have, you know, success and wealth through what we're building together. Um, But, you know, for as far as the flip goes, we'll flip it if we think we can make good money. If we think we can make a little bit less and wholesale it or wholetail it and not have to put in all that effort, then we'll take that that approach as well. So we, we try to take the easier road to revenue, not necessarily the hotter one. Do you focus on any type of price points at all? Uh, can you, regards to what? You know, so like the reason why it's very simple for me is I stick to under $300,000 price point of homes. I stick yeah. to single family homes. So it's very easy for me to wholesale flip or keep them as rentals. They fit all. It's just math at that point. At what buy price and what rent ratio does it become a better burr? then it becomes a flip. At what point does it become a better wholesale? Then it becomes a better whole uh, flipper rental. So I, for me, it's very simple because I only target a certain amount of price points and then I can just run the math backwards. Yeah, for sure. That makes perfect sense. So in New Hampshire, the average price point is 400,000. Massachusetts, you know, you're approaching $600,000. So single family burrs up here, they just don't exist. There's, there's right. no way. You know, we have some outlying areas that you can get it cheap enough, but it's very rare. Uh, it's even really difficult to do it on a two family. You really need to have a three family up. So we don't market a lot to multifamilies. We do to smaller multifamilies. And if those opportunities come, we take advantage of them. Um, but for the most part, you know, um, we focus just mostly on single, smaller multifamilies and those price points that you say. A lot of first time home buyers. So, you know, um, we, Really, the wholesale just comes down to like, you know, um, if we can't get access to the MLS, the seller just doesn't want us to promote it on the MLS for whatever reason, then then we'll just wholesale out of that. We put it on the market and we take the highest and best offer we can get. Yep. I love it. And I know you you coach a bunch of other people. What What's kind of your mission when you bring in students into your uh, REI Freedom? What are you kind of focusing on for them? 
Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, we're really focused on the sales skills of working direct to sellers. So as we talked about earlier in this podcast, you know, there's a lot of marketing channels that generate leads. And obviously, some are better than others. But your skill set, your ability to take those leads and convert them to deals and revenue is really the area that you need to get really good at in this business. So you could be a new person just starting out. It may take you 60 leads to get one deal. But with some good sales training and some good coaching on that side, you can now take 25 to 30 leads to get one deal. And, you know, you're now obviously you have learned the skill set to get these th- these deals um, at a lower price point, buy better with those sales skills. Also, exit out of them for a higher amount. So you're learning how to buy more, buy cheaper, sell higher, and also get more deals with the same amount of money that you're spending on lead gen. So we focus those sales skill on those sales skills because, listen, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with distressed sellers, habitual procrastinators, they tend to ghost you, life is falling down around them, they cr- crawl under rocks, they want help, but they don't accept it. There's a lot of nuances that come along with that. And, you know, you're not just dealing with, you know, business to business type sales. These are people that are emotional or rational, and it requires a lot of skill and nuances to successfully um, handle their emotions, handle their objections, and successfully convert deals. So where can everyone go find out more about Jeremy and then REI Freedom? Yeah, yeah, Facebook. That's the best way to go. Just go join our uh, Facebook free uh, REI Freedom Group. It's a private group. Me and Dan Tolback, who's a great coach himself, we provide a lot of great coaching in there for free. We just want to provide a lot of value, as you said. You know, it's a lot funner when you can do it together. Uh, you heard my story. I've been very blessed. I live a blessed life of of, of, of freedom. That's why we call it REI Freedom because anybody can build a life of freedom however they want through the power of real estate investing. It could be wholesaling. It could be flipping. It could be burring. It could be syndication. I don't care what you want to do. But real estate allows you this great opportunity to build a life of your dreams. So, you know, come in, REI Freedom Facebook group or reifreedom.com uh, on the web. Either way it works. And I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. Of course, bro. I appreciate you spending some time here at the Science of Flipping. Brother, appreciate you. Keep affecting lives. Keep crushing it. You are an Thanks, absolute man. rock star. See you all on the next episode of Science Flipping. Peace.